Yeah, the, the ego made this cosmos, it made this world. In other words, you know, some of us, it doesn't matter what theology we grew up with. I grew up in the Christian theology. So in the Christian theology was in the Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it took me a while to start to go, hmm, I'm being taught that God created the heavens and the ego projected time and space and including the earth. So when we see things like, like disabled children or disabled people that, that seem extremely dependent on others around them, that is a projection of this belief in lack. This whole cosmos of time and space is a projection of lack. Uh, there's never enough to go around. There's not enough air. You get out into space and there's not enough air to support life, so to speak, human life. There's, there's not enough money. There's not enough resources. Uh, there's, they're always struggling to redistribute the resources in this world, you know, so that to even it out a little bit so the rich don't have it all and, and it's spread out more easily. You know, we have socialism and all kinds of different isms and psychologies and political systems. So I, I can certainly relate. I ended up working at Ohio Valley Goodwill and I worked with, with people with a range of disabilities from physical disabilities like blindness and deafness to uh, mental disabilities with uh, different ranges of IQs and mental retardation. And so I had quite a lot of experience with what you're talking about and, and the people that I was relating to were young adults um, that that seemed to reflect that belief. The more I got deeper into spirituality that I started to realize was, was that as long as we're looking at the world as specifics and we're seeing specific problems like dependency, like we are still misperceiving everything. We are, we are looking at a world of unreality that is totally coming from a distorted lens. When I came to The Course in Miracles, it's like, high stuff. Basically it's saying, oh, your perception is distorted. You see nothing clearly. You're completely in the dark and you are completely clueless and everything you perceive in the world is a projection of the thoughts and beliefs in your minds. You, you are perceiving a world of lack. You are perceiving a world of fragmentation. You are perceiving separation everywhere because of the filter, the egoic filter that you're looking through. And I'd been an activist and I'd been involved in social services and I'd put paid my dues and done all the work and, and did that for years. And it was humbling to be told by this little blue book, seek not to change the world. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. So the first thing I would say in any authentic spiritual pathway will be to begin to open the mind to be convinced that the problem is a perceptual problem. Perceptual problem, what do we mean by that? You know, well, first of all, in psychology and psychiatry, we would say that somebody who hears many different voices speaking in their mind would be schizophrenic. This is Christ saying, everyone who comes to this world, everyone without exception is schizophrenic. They're listening to multiple voices in their mind. They can't make up their mind what to do. They have to listen to the committee every morning. Uh, 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 you know, it's... It's like the committee can't agree. And we wonder why human behavior is so inconsistent. <laughs> it's because there are multiple voices going on in there. It is a schizophrenic state. And the ultimate basis of that schizophrenia is that the mind that believes in this world is sleeping and dreaming and is trying to listen to two voices that don't have any meeting point and is trying to listen to them simultaneously. The ego and the spirit are, are inside our sleeping minds. And the spirit's trying, our intuition is trying to guide us out and guide us to peace of mind and joy and love and happiness. And the ego is sabotage 
everywhere. It's, it's a death wish. It's trying to sabotage us. It's, 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 it is sickness itself. It's, it's, we think of, of physical disabilities as sickness. No, it's the ego in the mind that we believe in that's the sickness. So that's a different take than I was raised with. I went through psychology. I went through psychiatry. I spent years in so social services. And finally I get to the master psychologist, Jesus, who's actually transcended this world completely. And he says, listen, I'm going to make it really direct to you. You're schizophrenic. And we got a lot of work to do to get out of this schizophrenic. And it's not only that you're schizophrenic, but you're psychotic. Okay, psychotic too. I'm schizophrenic and psychotic. What does that even mean? Well, psychosis, if you look at the definition in psychology and, and psychi psychiatry, psychosis is a break from reality. And everyone who believes in this world, everyone seems to come to this world and be identified as being a human being is psychotic because reality is nothing like this place. I mean absolutely nothing like this place. It's not even kind of like this place. <laughs> There's no war in reality. There's no sickness in reality. There's no separation in reality. There's no pleasure and pain in reality. There's no age in reality. There's no time in reality. There's no competition in reality. There's no male and female in reality. There's no masculine and feminine in reality. There is no duality in reality because reality is one. That's why the first commandment is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and might. It's, it's the Lord God and, and our true reality as we were created is pure oneness. And now even quantum physics is realizing we're all connected beyond this veil of separation that we all are completely connected. So the first thing I had to do, and it was extremely humbling, was start to realize, my gosh, every time I'm seeing a problem on the screen of the world that requires some kind of judgment or diagnosis or some kind of category or some kind of label, which is what this world is all about, it's total distortion. It's total distortion. There's no truth in any of it. So after 10 years of university, full time I might say, and after degrees and after really doing the renaissance thing and really studying up on the world, I actually got a, a dose of reality through some mystical experiences where I began with spiritual practices, with A Course in Miracles and so forth. And I had such blazing mystical experiences that on three different occasions the entire perceptual world just disappeared. It just completely vanished. I just pierced completely through the veil of time and space and it was the most blazing light. It was almost like in one sense kind of getting hit between the eyes with a loving fire hose of love. <laughs> it was it was just spectacular. And and that was, I always knew there was something fishy about the world, but until I experienced what was beyond this world, I never could say for sure. I just thought there was something fishy going on here. And when I experienced those mystical experiences, then it was like, aha. It was an actual experience, a taste of what lies beyond this world of distortions. And at that point, it was like, okay, uh, this was not like a near-death experience. I, I call them near-life experiences anyway. I, I don't think anybody ever has a near-death experience. They have a near-life experience. They go into this glowing, unconditional love and light. That sounds like a near-life experience to me. <laughs> and it gets described in this world as if, oh, the body was dead for three minutes or an hour or whatever. But once I had an experience of that, then... I began to attune my mind to it in a more regular way, in a more consistent way. And what that did was it opened the channel up for the spirit to use this, these lips and this tongue to speak of reality, to speak of the bridge to reality, to be a living example of that. I would have people that would start inviting me all over the world just because I was so happy just because I never have a bad day. That's the reason to get an invitation. Just think of it. 
if you never had a bad day, you might start getting some invitations from people that said, I like to hang around this energy of joy, of love, of freedom, of happiness. And I was content to be invisible. I was happy <laughs> feeling one with the universe. I didn't have to go anywhere, do anything. I'm just content to just be. And yet the spirit was like, no, I've got some speaking assignments for you. Okay, your show, you're the one. I give it over to you. And then I ended up with speaking assignments in 26 countries. And then I ended up with writing assignments that had been translated to, five, to six different languages. I ended up going on television. That was not part of my plan ever. I get, ended up going on radio. I ended up getting interviewed and all these different things. And just for one simple reason, it's because I'm happy. Isn't that a nice reason uh, to exist? <laughs> just plain, old, pure happiness. But what it did was I had to give up everything I believed about everything. Of all the problems on this planet Earth that appear in so many degrees and so many variations and so many different forms, that to try to fix the problems of the world on the level of the world would be like trying to plug a dam when a dam was breaking loose, you know, getting some rocks and some clay. We'll say you've got this long dam that's half a mile long and you're trying to plug it with rocks and pebbles and clay. It is impossible to solve the world's problems on the world's level. Even Einstein said you cannot solve a problem from the level of the problem. You have to transcend the level of the problem to find the solution. Of course, absolutely of course. And the good news that I'm sharing is that there is a spiritual solution that's within all of us that's available, totally accessible, totally there for us every moment of every day if we want to let go of thinking we know what we're doing, how to run the show, thinking we know anything. Uh, sometimes the Christians use this word salvation. As I was growing up Christian, I mean, I... I didn't. I never really liked that word, salvation, because it was always talked about as saving people. Oh, so Aunt Frida's got to be saved. Why does Aunt Frida have to be saved? She looks okay to me. She's not saved, uh, and these people over there aren't saved. I, I just did not like that idea of saving people, uh, salvation. I mean, it's one thing to save somebody who's drowning, but. But to talk about people that are just sitting there at the dinner table like they have to be saved, I thought, that's ridiculous. Well, I started to realize as I got deeper into A Course in Miracles, Jesus said it in one sentence. He said, salvation is for the mind and only for the mind, and it is attained through peace. Oh, that puts a whole different light on salvation. Salvation is for the mind. Oh, that mind that's sleeping, dreaming of exile. That mind that's sleeping, dr having distorted perceptual images and distorted sleep in a sense of it's upset. That mind needs to be saved from what? From the ego. <laughs> of course, that's what salvation is. 